It is the folly of many to envision history as one continual progress, as a lineage of ancestors, each building upon an unbroken chain of cultural heritage. Such is the story we hear with the Empire of Cyrodiil, a civilization of divine providence where emperors are granted the right to rule via the blessed covenant with Akatosh cemented in pact with the slave queen Alicia over 4,000 years ago. It is Alicia's very soul that became the crowning red diamond of the Amulet of Kings, the Kim El Adabal, a gem that became the symbol of the Empire and remained the authenticator of divine right to rule until its destruction at the end of the Third Era with the noble sacrifice of Martin Septim. In some ways, it would feel as if the very first human power in Cyrodiil shared a continuity with the Empire of today and in some aspects, that is true, but it is far from the full story. Traditionally, the imperial legacy of Cyrodiil is broken into three distinct empires. The first, the Elysian Empire, the second, which was the Riemann Empire, and the third empire established by Tiber Septim, ruled by his dynasty until the end of the Third Era. Now the Mede dynasty rules, even without the authority of the Amulet of Kings. Though they all share some connection in geography and culture, we would be foolish to think that in 4,000 years, there were not some drastic changes. You may be very surprised to find that the quasi-Romans we experience in Skyrim, in fact, have a very exotic and colorful past, filled with dark corners that hide the abstract, alien, and astonishing. Welcome to Fudge Muppet, my name is Scott, and today I will take you into the depths of histories and controversies that surround the imperial legacy of Cyrodiil. This will be a tour of many tangents and insights, so lay back, relax, and let me take you on this journey. Recorded history begins with the founding of the Cameron Dynasty in Valenwood, year one of the First Era. But Tamriel at this time is far from new. Aelid clans had long established dominion over the starry heart of Nern. Cyrid, it was named in their tongue. And while there is scholarly debate over the climate of this time, it was said to have once been a jungle. What Cyrodiil was like before their rule here, it is hard to say with certainty. The expeditions of Topol the pilot would speak of birdmen that lived upon the isles that would one day become the imperial city. And some speculate that the avian motifs of Aelid crafts find their origins here. Some even go as far to say that the Aelids interbred with the birdmen or were the birdmen. It's also entirely possible that Nidic groups of men were native to Cyrodiil and were subsequently enslaved by the elves. I will link a video in the description detailing the theory of man's early history, but considering that in the neighboring Black Marsh there is evidence of the Cothringi, a Nidic culture, suggesting they were contemporary with the ancient Argonian Zanmir culture, which itself predates elven arrival on Tamriel. If correct, this would imply Nidic inhabitation of Tamriel before elven arrival. It is a messy business, separating fact from fiction, passing the myths of cultures and bias of records, but in the end, you need only know that it was a possibility that man was there before Elf. However, the facts are, by the beginning of recorded history, the Aelid Elves of Cyrodiil had an enslaved Nidic populace for generations, and those Nidic slaves worshipped the gods of their Ald Mary overlords. There are several factors that led to the dominance of man upon Tamriel, and by the start of recorded history, many of these were already at play. In the northern lands of Skyrim, the Falmer civilization was all but extinct, and the sons of Isgrimor had ruled here for centuries already. The Narfinsal Schism had already divided the Aelids themselves, with the Aedra-worshipping clans pitted against the clans that had adopted Daedra worship, all of which culminated in the scouring of Wendelbeck, the climax of the centuries-long conflict that occurred year 198 of the First Era. This saw the expulsion of the Aedra-worshipping Barsabic Aelids from the heartland, and organized opposition to Daedra worship in Cyrodiil was no more. The decadence of their kingdoms knew no bounds, a culture shift that no doubt furthered the cruelty inflicted upon the needs. Flesh sculptures, gut gardens, and wailing wheels. These were the art tortures made of the Nidic slaves, horrors that no doubt contributed to their desperation for liberty. 
42 years after the scouring of Wendelbeck, the Skyrim conquests of High King Vraga the Gifted began, and the Nordic domain spread into parts of Hyrok, Morrowind, and Nibine. The Nords presumably liberated many Nidic tribes, and two years later, the Elysian Rebellion erupted, led by one known as the Slave Queen. It was an alliance of Nords, Nidic slaves, and even some Aelid rulers who sympathized with man's plight. And of course, too, there were demigod heroes like Morahouse and Pelennal Whitestrake who were instrumental in this rebellion. By the next year, the Aelid's doom was written in blood, and this marked the beginning of the Elysian Empire, the first imperial regime of man in Cyrodiil, the roots of modern imperial culture. You may not know that Elysia is not even the Slave Queen's real name. The name Elysia is a more modern corruption of the title Alesh, which translates to High Highness. Her birth name is unknown. Alesh is renowned not only for her covenant with Akatosh, but for the creation of the Eight Divines. The Nords worshipped their Nordic gods, and the Nedics worshipped the Aldmeri gods of their former overlords, and so Elysia tailored a new pantheon, a compromise that satisfied all who dwelt within this new society comprising of Nords, Nedes, and Aelids who had helped the rebellion. And it was this emerging faith that laid the foundation for imperial culture and its cosmopolitan, pluralistic attitudes. Soon, Cyrodiil would take faith in the Eight Divines, yet this period was more short-lived than one might think. From the year 243 to the year 266 of the First Era, Empress Elysia ruled over this new society, and from our understanding of the scarce records, it seems the Empire at this time had direct autonomous rule over the Heartland and the Nibine Valley, while the burgeoning kingdoms of what would later be known as Colovia and the Aelid lords who assisted her rebellion were vassals under her rule. In the mythic histories of Sirid, it is said that Morahouse the Winged Bull, the son of Kine, became Alesh's lover, and they had a child, Belhaza, the second ruler of the Elysian Empire, and more controversially, it is claimed that he was the very first Minotaur. You heard that right. Belhaza, the second emperor of Cyrodiil, was a minotaur, born of Elysia and Morahouse. Belhaza the man-bull is undeniable. All the records of this time speak to his appearance as such. However, the scholars of later empires would deny any association between Belhaza and the race of minotaurs that inhabit the breadth of Tamriel. The mainstream view of minotaurs is similar to that of goblins. They are a race of lesser civilization who are openly hostile to the sophisticated races of the Empire, so to suggest that these beasts share some sort of imperial lineage is heretical. However, on the contrary, records of early Elysian days, while fragmented, do recognize the appearance and proliferation of the Minotaur race during and after Empress Elysia's reign. Art and tomes of the period suggest that Minotaurs were among the Empress's most devoted defenders, and that they were as intelligent as any other elf, orc, or Khajiit. It is possible that Elysia had several other Manbull children with Morahouse that we do not know about, or perhaps that Belhaza himself had many concubines and many children which gave rise to the race. Perhaps also Morahouse, after the death of Elysia, continued to have children with other mortal women. The controversial theories of Nonus Caprenius state that the Minotaurs of today have been reduced to their current primal state due to the actions of the later Elysian Order, who likely expanded their anti-elven sentiments to any non-humans of the Empire. Isolated and cast to the edges of society, the Minotaurs, he suggests, have degenerated in both intelligence and culture. However, strangely, Minotaurs in the wild are known to congregate at or near ancient sites of significance to the Empire, an act which known as suggests is because Minotaurs have an instinctual memory of a time when they were the fierce defenders of a fledgling imperial civilization. At its inception, under the reign of Elysia and Belhaza after her, the Empire would have looked quite foreign to modern conceptions of Cyrodiil. 
Imagine an old Belhaza sitting upon the ruby throne, horns adorned in silk fabrics and beads. At his neck is the Amulet of Kings, as he presides over a council of Nedic tribe leaders, while hoplites and minotaurs, among them his sons, brothers, or perhaps even cousins, are standing guard. Aelid and Clovian vassals come to pay their respects to the Emperor and reaffirm their loyalty. It would have been a strange sight to behold. And even if it were exactly as I described, this state of affairs only lasted for not much more than a century. You see, it was only 118 years after the Elysian Rebellion that the Elysian doctrines were enforced by law, and an aeon of zealous bloodshed and tyranny would scar the land. This dire turn for the fledgling empire started in the strangest of ways, in the coastal jungle of the Colovian West, in the fever dreams of a monkey. While not a jungle in the modern day, this coastal jungle is likely referring to what is now the Gold Coast region, which borders Valenwood to the south. In Valenwood, there exists an intelligent race of apes called Imga, and it was believed that Maruk, the monkey prophet, the simian, was among their kind, and perhaps the Imga once more broadly inhabited Cyrodiil's early jungled landscape. But in any case, the outward appearance is not the contribution of Maruk, but rather the philosophies and teachings of his mind. Sometime before the Elysian Order took control of the Empire in year 361, the not yet prophet Maruk received a vision that would change the world. In an ancient fragmented account, it says, because he had toyed with the ape maiden Dulsa, did Maruk spend his century of penance upon the stone meadows, and his sight was seared, and his tongue was swollen, and his pelt was mottled, and his left thumb pointed ever at the stars of the tower. And ever did the shade of Alesh speak to him, serrated words that rasped his concept organ and brought him to wisdom through affliction. And he recorded her words in his simian gore with glyphs on the beseeching scarp. And the fire in his blood did etch the lithic face with the seventy-seven inflexible doctrines. And though the labor depleted, ye even consumed his very substance, he stinted not, for he knew that death is an illusion. For did not Alesh persist, speaking knives through dead? And had not Pelinal been witness to her death, although dead himself, at the death of Umaril. Then did Maroc know a right reaching, that one devoted to proper life and Elnofic annulment shall persist beyond the illusion of death, for indeed, the drive to expunge corruption can conquer even the Archaean cycle. Poetic indeed, the spirit of Elysia had come to him in his century of penance, and he was given truth in the form of the 77 inflexible doctrines, which were the guiding words of this new faith. The Elysians spoke of their single god, in increasingly abstract and unknowable depictions, named simply the One. Remember where the dragonfires are lit? Where Martin Septim made his sacrifice? Yes, that is why it's called the Temple of the One. It's a very ancient structure, once built by the devout Elysians. While the Elysian Order venerated only this One, they incorporated many polytheistic elements into their evolving canon, accepting gods as spirits, saints, and divine aspects that all took place under the One. If we were to accept all that is said about the Godhead as total truth, and that the Orbis takes place in the dream of this being, then perhaps the Elysians were the closest to understanding the truth of the universe, there being only One, the Godhead, all else being aspects of varying degree. Though at the same time, it is strongly implied that this one is most closely associated with a more abstract version of Akatosh, the unitary essence. Some things to consider here, but regardless, the priesthood of this charismatic, burgeoning religion made many converts among the lower classes of the Nibine, and soon by the year 361 of the First Era, the Elysian Order became the dominant political factor of the Empire, and the doctrines were enforced by law throughout. The inflexible doctrines spoke of much, including prohibitions on most forms of entertainment and severe restrictions on the work of artists, as well as a foundational principle for the legal system which still applies to this day. All are guilty until they have proven themselves innocent. In Cyrodiil and all under imperial law, the onus is on the accused to build a case and absolve themselves of the crime. 
Ascetism, zealous faith, and law seem to have been the core philosophies of the Elysian doctrines. It was dogmatic. In Eastern Cyrodiil, the priesthood of this faith had made many converts among the lower classes of Nibine, and during the further centuries of this religious dominance, near every aspect of their lives was codified, and the eight divines, which were treated as aspects of the one, were replaced largely with a Baroque veneration of ancestor spirits and god animals, which gave way to all kinds of restrictions on meat eating and agriculture, which made farming and animal husbandry near impossible. Yet funnily enough, this shift forced many to survive as merchants, and soon Nibine became incredibly wealthy with a cultural reputation for mercantilism. Colovia largely resisted most changes, and they kept strong faith in the eight divines that Alicia herself gave to the people, and later the Clovians would form an autonomous confederacy of kingdoms that acted as a bulwark against Alician influence. It is a shame that the name Alician has been conflated with this zealous and radical religious order that gained control of the empire. Empress Alicia herself was tolerant and let the Aelids that helped her cause remain as vassal kingdoms, yet in the days since her death, tolerance for elven kind diminished, and as the anti-elven teachings of the prophet Maroc took sway among the populace, violence against their settlements took place, and by the time the Elysian Order came to power in 361, Aelid lordships were revoked. In 374, the Elysians gave the last remaining state of Menelata an ultimatum leave or face extermination. King Loloriaran Dinar gathered all who would leave with him and took an exodus to High Rock, to Dureni lands. All who remained at Nenalata were massacred by the Elysian Zealots. The Elysian Order was at its height in the early 5th century of the First Era. The arch prelate of the faith was near equal in power to the emperor himself, yet towards the end of that same century, the Elysian Order would face many setbacks that would cement their long, dwindling doom. The rebellion of Rislav Larich and the establishment of the Colovian Estates, along with the rise of High King Wulfarth in Skyrim, in addition to the resounding defeat at the Battle of Glenumbria Moors, all these components resulted in the diminishing of the Elysian Empire's power outside of the Nibine Valley and the Heartland. Glenumbria Moors is often considered the beginning of the long downfall of the First Empire, which finally dissolved year 2331 of the First Era. If that seems like an absurdly long time for an empire to die out, you'd be right. But mind you, in this time, there was reportedly a dragon break called the Middle Dawn, a 1008 year period of timeless time where all manner of metaphysical quackery and contradicting timelines occurred. Some scholars claim that this is simply dating errors of historians, but regardless, we must factor this in. And if most sources are to be believed, then it was actually the Elysians themselves that caused it. Among the highest, most elite of the Elysians was a particular sect, the Marukati Selectives. As you can probably surmise from their namesake, they were the most zealous of the zealous. Their guiding principles were the exclusionary mandates, which were as follows. The exclusionary mandates of Marukite selection, all are equal. One, that the Supreme Spirit Akhtosh is of unitary essence, as proven by the monolinearity of time. One, that Shazar the missing sibling is singularly misplaced and therefore doubly venerated. One, that the protean substrate that informs all denial of one is the Aldmeri taint. One, that the prophet most Simeon demonstrated that monothought begets proper life. One, that the purpose of proper life is the expungement of the taint. One, that the Ark of Time provides the mortal theater for the sacred expungement. One, that Akatosh is time, is proper life, is taint death. These essentially attribute Aldmeri taint to anything that deviates from their faith, from their concept of unity, of the one, and it is their goal to remove the Aldmeri taint, such as the form of Oriel, from the Supreme Spirit Akatosh, via the sacred expungement, which can be performed during a dragon break, aka the mortal theatre provided by the Ark of Time. 
They sought to remove any Aldmeri influence from the Time God, to mythically remove these aspects from Akatosh. They performed the dance with the Staff of Towers, and with the guidance of the Prophet Most Simeon, the Middle Dawn Dragon Break was made. Whether or not they were successful in their goal of removing the Aldmeri components of Akatosh, it is hard to say with certainty. The metaphysics of this are quite complicated and inconclusive without considering outside sources. Perhaps even a jungled Cyrodiil was such Aldmeri taint, and during the Middle Dawn, it was perhaps changed. Regardless, the Elysian Order and the First Empire over which it held immense sway was a period of great darkness, as modern Imperials would see it. The near entirety of the First Empire was coloured by intolerance, zealousness, cruelty and stricture, hardly the legacy you may have first thought of. The split between East and West Cyrodiil was cemented when the Clovian Estates were formed, and understandably throughout the long history of the Elysian-controlled Nibine and Heartland, the East diverged significantly from the Western culture. Traditionally, the East has been regarded as the region's soul, magnanimous, tolerant and administrative, a place of mercantilism, majocracy, and thousands of cults to spirits, god animals, and cultural heroes. All manner of mystic can be found in Cyrodiil's East, but there is a cult dedicated to one animal in particular that I find very interesting. The Ancestor Moth, a rare indigenous species of gypsy moth, has long been the focus of Cyrodiilic veneration, a tradition that has been around for thousands of years, perhaps even predating the formation of the Elysian Empire itself. The cult believes that the spirit of their ancestors are manifest within these moths. It is what they call a fyron, which can be loosely translated as the will to peace. Abbot Crassius Viria explains, The soul has much in common with the moth. They are a symbolic pair, though it is typical to think of it as the adric essence at the core of every mortal. I advised him to consider the soul in another light, scaled like the wings of a moth, and to imagine it comprised of vessels filled through the events of mortal existence. On release from life on Nern, it is our belief that a kind of dissipation begins, and it is that the moths learn the song of a soul's fyrons, which are shepherded under our care and protected generation after generation. The Fyarons themselves must retain a connection to the grand fabric of creation, to the scattered soul remnants in all their destinations. Through this link and with patient care, we receive guidance from beyond the present or past and the known world, where time is irrelevant. The moths do not capture or devour the souls of the ancestors, but only repeat to us what they've filtered, like a chorus repeating the verses of a grand song. Moth priests engage in a practice where the singing and hymnal spirits of one's forebears are caught in a special silk gathering ritual, the resource of which is used to create any manner of vestment or costume. The swishing of this material during normal movement reproduces the resplendent ancestral chorus contained therein it, and this quickly became a sacred custom among the early Nibbanese, which has persisted to the present day. Monks of the higher orders of the cult of the Ancestor Moth are able to forego the magical ritual needed to enchant this fabric, and indeed prefer to instead to wear the moths about their neck and face. They are able to attract the Ancestor Moths through the application of finely ground bark dust gathered from the Gypsy Moth's favourite tree and through the sub-vocalisation of certain mantras. They must chant the mantras constantly to maintain skin contact with the Ancestor Moths, a discipline that they endure for the sake of some cosmic balance. When a monk interrupts these mantras in conversation, for example, the Moths burst from him in glorious fashion every time he speaks, only to light back upon his skin when he resumes the inaudible chant. The adepts of such meditative practices often develop prescient powers, for the wisdom of the ancestors can sing the future into the present, and it is for this reason that the cult of the Ancestor Moth have been given the exclusive privilege to interpret the Elder Scrolls, a privilege that in time results in the inevitable blinding of the priest. The mysteries of the moth are vast, and there are some interesting things to consider. Firstly, it is in the songs of Pelennor that Plontinu, a Nedic warrior of the Elysian Rebellion, was smothered by moths the night he claimed that Pelennor was the Shezerim. If the moths are to be interpreted as the same ancestor moths that have an intrinsic link to the ancestors of past and future of a place outside time, then what function were they performing here? silencing one who claimed Pelennor as a Shezerine. 
Perhaps this truth was not meant for this time. Perhaps it was Palinol himself who instructed the moths to smother Pontinu. Perhaps it was his interactions with the moths that gave him knowledge of a future time, of the not yet born Riemann Emperor, whose name he shouts in praise during one of his frenzies. Perhaps the moths have long travelled with Palinol and given him insights in and outside time that drive him to madness, that drive him to abandon the kingdoms which he has built. Secondly, consider that in the Atmoran totemic religion from which the Nordic pantheon derives, Dibella is associated with or depicted as a silver moth. While not explicitly an ancestor moth, I'm curious if some kind of connection can be made. Consider that Pelinal, a Shazarine, is considered an avatar of Shor, the chief of the Nordic pantheon and equivalent of Lorcan, and Dibella is originally a god of the Nords, who found her way into the imperial pantheon of today with the Elysian creation of the Ape. It's probably too vague a connection to mean anything conclusive, but perhaps you can think of something in the comments below. So far, we've had minotaurs, monkey prophets, and moth priests as the stranger aspects of imperial legacy, but now we shall approach the somewhat familiar with the second empire, that of Riemann. Riemann is an incredibly interesting character whose tales are tightly interwoven with prophecy and myth. Presumably, the bloodline of Empress Alicia was broken with the dissipation of the Elysian Empire. The records of the specifics are lost to history, but we come to the tale of the Remonada and the origins of the new emperor. And in those days, the empire of the Cyrodiils was dead, save in memory only, for through war and slug famine and iniquitous rulers, the West split from the East and Colovia's estrangement lasted some four hundreds of years. And the earth was sick with this sundering, once worthy western kings of Anvil and Sartral, of Falkreath and Dalodil, became through pride and habit as like thief barons and forgot covenant. In the heartland things were no better, as arcanists and false moth princes lay in drugged stupor or the studies of vileness, and no one sat on the throne in dusted generations. Snakes and the warnings of snakes went unheeded, and the land bled with ghosts and deep-set holes unto cold harbours. It is said that even the Kim el Adabal, the amulet of kings of glory, had been lost and its people saw no reason to find it. And it was in this darkness that King Kroll set out from the lands beyond Lost Twill, with a sortie of questing knights numbered eighteen less one, all of them western sons and daughters. For Kroll had seen in his visions the snakes to come and sought to heal all the borders of his forebears, and to this host appeared at last a spirit who resembled none other than Alestia, queen of ancient times, who bore in her left hand the dragon fire of the Akatosh, and in her right right hand the jewels of the covenant, and on her breast a wound that split void onto her mangled feet. And seeing Elestia and Kim el Adabal, Kroll and his knights wailed and set to their knees, and prayed for all things to become as right. Unto them the spirit said, I am the healer of all men and the mother of dragons, but as you have run so many times from me, so shall I run until you learn my pain, which renders you and all this land dead. And the spirit fled from them, and they split among hills and forests to find her, all grieving that they had become a villainous people. Kroll and his shield thane were the only ones to find her, and the king spoke to her, saying, I love you, sweet Aless, sweet wife of Shaw and of Oriel and of the sacred bull, and would render this land alive again, not through pain, but through a return to the dragon fires of covenant, to join east and west, and throw off all ruin. And the shield thane bore witness to the spirit opening naked to his king, carving on a nearby rock the words, And Troll did love unto a hillock, before dying in the sight of their union. When the fifteen other knights found King Hroll, they saw him dead after his labours against a mound of mud, and they parted each in their way, and some went mad, and the two that returned to their homeland beyond Twill would say nothing of Hroll, and acted ashamed for him. But after nine months that mound of mud became as a small mountain, and there were whispers among the shepherds and bulls. 
A small community of believers gathered around that growing hill during the days of its first churning, and they were the first to name it the Golden Hill, Sankator. And it was the shepherdess, said Yenna, who dared climb the hill when she heard his first cry, and at its peak she saw what it had yielded. An infant she named Riemann, which is Light of Man. And in the child's forehead was the Kim El Adabal, alive with the dragon fires of yore and divine promise, and none dared obstruct said Yenna when she climbed the steps of White Gold Tower to place the babe Riemann on his throne, where he spoke as an adult, saying, I am Cyrodiil, come. So in summary, the Colovian King Hroll came upon the spirit of Elestia, another name for Saint Alicia, and Hroll found her and made love to her. More specifically, he made love unto a hillock. He impregnated the very land itself. Metaphorically, Alicia and Cyrodiil are one in the same here, and the land became pregnant with swollen belly. The golden hill formed, and at its peak it gave birth to Riemann, wearing the amulet of kings upon his forehead. When he says, I am Cyrodiil come, he is stating that he is the very manifestation of the land and of the covenant with Akatosh, and hence he is known as Riemann Cyrodiil, a legitimate heir to the empire born of Alicia, the spirit of the Cyrodiils. If you were curious, there is actually a piece called The Shoni Etta, written by Michael Kirkbride out of game in 2012. It's a continuation of Riemann's story as told in the Remonada, which Kirkbride himself wrote for Oblivion, the game in which the Remonada text appeared. So while the following is not strictly canon, it is a continuation of a canon work by its original author. It is a wacky, um, poetic pornography of Riemann myth. <laughs> I can only really give you the summarized version. The aforementioned said Yenna, the shepherdess that found Riemann as a baby atop the golden hill, had a sister called Shoniette, and both were Dubelashut, practitioners of belly magics, the sex magic of Dubella essentially. They were to raise Riemann in the ways of the Nibbanese, yet Dubella also appeared to them and relieved them of all their duties to her temple and instead gave them a single charge. When he has reached manhood, teach him of all you know of the flesh, and then save within yourselves his seed, and let it not take purchase within either of you. Store it all, whichsoever body cup he spills into, and in secret make of it bread for him to eat. And keep this new edict of the convention quiet from all others, even from him, and know by this mention that it is my lord Akka, the king of heaven, who commands it. So, yes, Akatosh commanded Debella to instruct said Yenna and Shoniat to give Riemann hands-on sex education, secretly store his semen and make it into bread for him to eat, whatever the hell that looks like. Um, in later passages, Riemann ejaculates on his dead enemies, which he can do without using his hands after years of training in the Debella shoot. He also bites a guy's face off. Why this isn't canon, I haven't the slightest idea, but uh, in all honesty, there are some cool moments and poetic descriptions, but overall, it's perhaps a little bit too much. But uh, back to the canon. Now, the Remonada, the story of Riemann's birth, could all be total hogwash and mere mythical propaganda to cement Riemann as a legitimate blood descendant of Alicia. But that's boring. Sometimes I think it's fun to look at the Elder Scrolls separately through two different lenses. A, that everything is mundane and myth is just lies and cultural stories, and B, that all myth is literally true and it all happened. The truth of it is probably somewhere in the middle between A and B, but the latter lens in particular sometimes creates some very interesting possibilities and greater appreciation for symbolism. Regardless, Riemann did end up uniting the divided halves of Cyrodiil in order to stand against the Akaviri invasion, and at the Pale Pass, when the Snakemen, the Sayesi, heard Riemann's voice, they bent the knee and proclaimed him Dragonborn. Supposedly, they were actually looking for a dragonborn as well. 
Riemann accepted their surrender and incorporated many of the Akaviri as his Dragon Guard. Akaviri weaponry, tactics, training and administrative structures were incorporated into the formation of the newly restructured Imperial Legions. With the unparalleled measure of coherence, logistics and disciplines courtesy of the Akaviri, Riemann's legions easily overpowered the other regional armies of Tamriel, allowing him to conquer all but Morrowind. The house guard of the Riemann dynasty was typically Akaviri, and so too was their chief advisor, the potentate of Akaviri descent. It was this fusion of cultures that actually gave rise to the imperial legions that you would be more familiar with. It was also the Riemann dynasty that ushered in the tradition that is the lighting of the dragon fires, where the newly coronated emperor must light the brazier with the amulet of kings. The Mead and Septim dynasties in many aspects are far closer to the Riemann dynasty in terms of culture than the Riemann dynasty was to the Elysian Empire before them. May it also be known that it was in the time of Riemann that Clovian influence and hence the Eight Divines were reasserted over the Nibine, which throughout the centuries would erode the many cults and disparate practices of the Nibinese, leading to the more homogenized imperial East of the modern day. Don't get me wrong, the Riemann Empire was still significantly different to the later Septim Empire, but it would seem that Akaviri influence was what really laid the foundations of the empire we know today. The Riemann dynasty lasted only 217 years, with its controversial end at the hands of the Morag Tong. However, the Second Empire itself continued for a further 430 years. You heard that right. The Sayesi potentates, Versiduche and subsequently his son Savrian Chorak, continued to rule over the Riemann Empire for nearly twice as long as the Riemann dynasty that founded it. Cyrodiil was ruled by snakemen for over four centuries, and they brought many innovations and changes that would give way to foundational aspects of the imperial culture today, such as the Guild Act of Year 321 of the Second Era. This story begins in the 283rd year of the Second Era. Potentate Versiduche was faced with a disintegrating empire. The vassal kingdoms throughout Tamriel had reached a new height of rebellion, openly challenging his rule. They refused his taxes and led sorties against the imperial garrisons throughout the land. At the destruction of his fortress in Dawnstar, he gathered the imperial council in what would be called the Council of Bardmont, after the town south of Dawnstar where they met. There, the potentate declared universal martial and imperial law. The princes of Tamriel would dissolve their armies or face his wrath. The next 37 years were perhaps the bloodiest in the violent history of Tamriel. In order to crush the last of the royal armies, Versiduche had to sacrifice many of his best legions as well as spend nearly every last piece of gold in the imperial treasury. But he accomplished the unthinkable. For the first time in history, there was but one army in the land and it was his own. The problems that immediately surfaced were almost as staggering as the triumph itself. The potentate had impoverished the land by his war, for the vanquished kingdoms had also spent the last of their gold in defense. Farmers and merchants alike had their livelihood ruined. Before the princes of Tamriel would not pay his taxes, now they could not. The only persons who benefited from the war were criminals who preyed upon the ruins of the lawless land without fear of arrest now and all the local guards and militia were gone. It was a crisis that Akavir had seen coming long before he destroyed the last of his subjects' armies, but for which he had no solution. He could not allow his vassals their own armies again, but the land was deeper into the stew of anarchy than it had been before. His army sought to fight the rise of crime, but a central authority was no threat against the local underworld. In the dawn of the year 320, a kinsman of Versiduche, Daenerys Vess, the Iron, presented himself with a host of companions before the potentate. It was he who suggested the order of mercantile warriors for hire, who could be hired by nobility in lieu of a standing army. The employment would be temporary, and a percentage of their fees would go to the potentate's government, thus putting salve on two of Versiduche's greatest pain. Though it was then called the Sifim, after the Sayesi word for soldiers, the organization that was to be known as the Fighters Guild had been born. The Fighters Guild was a great success, and in the year 321 of the Second Era, the Potentate gave his approval to the Guilds Act, officially sanctioning the mages, together with the Guild of Tinkers, Cobblers, Prostitutes, Scribes, Architects, Brewers, Vinters, Weavers, Ratcatchers, Furriers, Cooks, Astrologers, Healers, Tailors, Minstrels, Barristers, and more. 
The time of the snakes came to an end, and potentate Savrion Chorak was assassinated by a poisoned black dart of the Morag Tong in the year 430. The Second Empire officially collapsed, only to be resurrected by Tiber Septim in the year 896 of the Second Era, giving way to the Third Era, and to the Third Empire of which we are most familiar with. The imperial legacy of Cyrodiil is not quite what one might think when looking at the quasi-Roman soldiers of the Fourth Era Empire. From a minotaur emperor to a monkey prophet who through his religious teachings turned the First Empire into an ascetic, zealous tyranny, from the esoteric cults of the East and monks who read the Elder Scrolls themselves with assistance of ancestor moths, to kings of the West that impregnate hills to give birth to a new imperial dynasty, whose very own empire would be ruled over by foreign snake men for longer than their own blood. The history of Cyrodiil is vast and strange, but no matter what any would say, it is the starry heart of Nern, the center of the stage. It is where fate is made and stories are told. It is Cyrodiil, the crowning gem of Dawn's beauty. Thank you so much for following me on this exploration of the weirdness of Cyrodiil's imperial legacy. Hopefully you learned something new. I also want to give the Beyond Skyrim Cyrodiil team thanks for allowing me to capture footage in their beautiful work. Please do give the video a like, subscribe for more Elder Scrolls goodness. My name is Scott and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.